Okay. So now I'm finally live again after I don't want to tell you how many times I tried. <laughs> but, you know, you can't give up. Uh, sooner or later, this tech stuff works out. I mean, I got to say, I went 23 days in this 31-day total live stream slash replay streak without a tech problem ever. <laughs> so I guess I was due, you know. And the thing is, when you do your live streams on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or anywhere else, when you're doing content marketing on behalf of your business, guess what? It's going to be, you know, you're going to have tech issues no matter what you do and no matter how hard you try. At least I made it through the first 23 days in this series without being late, without any tech issues or anything like that. So if you're listening live, please just do me a favor. Let me know if there's an echo, if there's any problems. Uh, and because I've now I've relaunched everything. I've relaunched everything. So I apologize for this being a late stream, but I have been having the hardest time today with getting on and then not having an echo. So if you're watching, let me know if there's an echo. Uh, it seems like there's a little bit of a lag or a delay um, on my end, but maybe it's not on your end. So um, anyway, in the meantime, I'm going to, uh, I pinned uh, in the replay, oh, hello, I pinned for the first comment down below, and I'll do it on the replay too, the uh, whole playlist of all the coaching sessions that this live stream slash replay will become a part of. It's super good. Oh, thank you. I'm chicken swell. That makes me feel so much better. Okay. Hi, I'm chicken swell. Well, welcome or welcome back to my channel. This is the number one place for the more mature entrepreneur to go when they say, fine, you got me. I'm going to get into this content marketing on social media, maybe even on YouTube and elsewhere sort of thing. But if I'm going to do content marketing and I got to go where the attention is, I need to drive more traffic to my business so that I can do more business. Nobody seems to talk to me about conversions and maybe all I'm doing is posting content up and nothing's happening or almost nothing's happening. It doesn't seem worth it to me if I'm a solopreneur and I have to wear all the hats. It doesn't seem worth it to me if I have a small team to do content marketing, because after all, I don't need something else to do on my to-do list or my busy list. I'm too busy personally and professionally to take on content marketing, unless it's going to earn its keep, Stacy. So here's the deal. That's what my channel is about normally. Uh, the pre-edited videos that are on my channel, those videos are all organized into nice, neat little playlists. So if you haven't subscribed to me yet, please make sure that you do. Um, I've got playlists for Instagram SEO. If you didn't know that was the thing, I have a, a playlist for that. I have a playlist for Instagram Reels or marketing on Instagram itself. Marketing as an older entrepreneur or as an entrepreneur parent. Um, yay, it's clear. Thank you, Lisa Garrett. I really appreciate it. Hi, Lisa Garrett. What's up? Yay, Lenore Love. Yes, I'm live. Lenore, you do not even want to know all the problems that I had getting on today and not having a bajillion echoes. So really quickly, for those people who do live streams, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or anywhere else, sometimes you're going to have connectivity problems. I live in upstate New York. I'm sure that's part of it today. Sometimes it's not a connectivity problem but you might have to like update and or relaunch your browser, update and or relaunch your operating system, and then just relaunch your device cold. Um, and then, you know, mess around with your mic. I had to do all those things today just to be able to go live at all. Okay. So what a pain because I was supposed to go live at nine and it's like a half an hour later. But what are you going to do? These things happen, and I don't want any entrepreneur watching me live or on the replay to just declare, oh, it's too much trouble, because people love lives, and most algorithms will push you out. When you go live, it'll ping your followers or subscribers first, um, but if you optimize your content really well while you're live, and then when you post the replay, 
you are very likely going to have the algorithms on each platform that you go on live on surface all of your optimization and say, hey, you know, um, surface all of your content, your keywords, hashtags were applicable and go, hey, I bet I can fetch another audience that aren't followers or subscribers, but should be reviewing this content uh, because it's beneficial to them and it matches their search and or content consumption behaviors and patterns on the platform. That's why I teach my paid students specifically how to go about, and we'll touch on some of this stuff today, how to go about optimizing their content for search and for suggested, right? So that it gets recommended out or suggested out. There may be some delays. I'm in upstate New York. We're having some wind. So I apologize if today isn't the very, very best uh, in terms of results. So hashtag live, hashtag replay. If you're watching on the replay and you have any questions about the content that we are going to cover today, and we are going to talk about optimizing your content so it increases your sense of self-esteem as an entrepreneur, because it you, you are facing, as we've discussed over the last few days of these live streams slash replays that we're doing, one for every day in January 2022, we have talked about how hard it can be to put yourself out there as an entrepreneur, right? If you missed any of the replay sessions or the lives now replays, the first comment down below live and on the replay for this video is the playlist so you can catch up with us. Every single video can kind of stand on its own, but for best results, you want to watch this thing all the way through. If you say nobody ever does any free coaching, no one ever puts out any sort of real content, or if they do, they're cheap about it. Let me tell you, these live streams, we go long. I answer questions. I answer questions on the replay. I'm there and I care, all right? So just in case, this is a good um, primer for you. Great primer on optimizing with hashtags. And I'm going to put this video that I did before down below, and I will put it in the uh, show notes or the description for this when it goes into replay video mode. So live, you guys have the pinned comment, but you also have the video that uh, I believe the title was blow up your Instagram with this hashtag strategy. And it has worked very, very nice. And that video has gotten a lot of views and very good feedback. So if you've not watched that video before, whether you're a subscriber of mine or not, you should check that video out as well because it will cover even more fine green some of the stuff that we're going to touch upon today. All right, so we're going to talk about building up your self-esteem as um, an entrepreneur, kind of like looking at things in terms of hashtag you, but then we're going to cross over into more fine grain, actionable stuff when it comes to hashtag optimization, because I could all but guarantee you that you do not, you may be optimizing with hashtags, like not every platform requires the use of hashtags. Right now, I would be using hashtags to optimize my content on platforms like Twitter or Instagram um, or TikTok. Those are like the holy trinity. Um, using hashtags on <laughs> Facebook is kind of kind of silly. Um, it does not get you where you need to go. Um, let me just delete the previous version of this live stream. Sorry, guys. I tried like three, four times to go, hey, happy honeybee and company. What's going on? Good to see you. So we're going to get into some actionable steps. Yay. No more echo, says Ann McDonald. So for Ann... And for everybody else who's just joining on with us now, um, you know, when you go live, sometimes you'll have, besides connectivity issues, there's, there might be only so much you could do about that. If there's ever an echo, if there's ever too much lag, and you're finding out that it's got to be you because everyone's having that problem, not just one or two people. If one or two people are having a problem on your live, just tell them to refresh the page and stuff because it's usually on there. And but once you start getting like a bunch of people, like I've had several times today trying to go live before now saying, whoa, there's an echo. Whoa, it's poor sound quality. And you've fiddled with your mic if you have an external mic or whatever. And that's not it. You're probably going to have to update and reboot your browser. 
you're probably going to have to update and reboot your uh, operating system and then update you. I'm sorry, reboot your device. That's all the steps that I had to take with several attempts to finally get to a point where everybody's saying everything's good now. All right. And you can't lose your cool and get too flustered. Um, like I said earlier, I made it through 23 days straight of doing live streams and posting replays without ever having a problem really being late. Um, you know, day 24, I rolled snake eyes. What are you going to do? Um, what a great example for us. You're welcome. <laughs> so really, really quickly, um, hashtag live, give this video a big thumbs up. Let me turn on the fan in my room. That's not going to affect anything. Because it's super hot in here now because it's super cold outside. So we turned up the heat. And I don't want to sit here and sweat in front of everybody. That would be gross. Okay. So I'm going to talk about in previous days, you want to catch up with this series if you haven't already. In previous days, we talked about how hard it can be to be an entrepreneur. Because even if you grow into an advanced business, $100,000 a year or more, and you're growing a team and you're growing and scaling to the moon with that team. You can't always escape rejection. You're going to have some responsibility to interface with the public, to interface with customers as the business owner. And you're going to face negativity and rejection no matter how hard you and eventually you and your team work. Okay. So We've discussed that, and a lot of people have been very vulnerable and transparent and shared over the last few days how hard it is to take that kind of rejection. And maybe to some degree, they are, hey, Marissa Parsons, yay, we're echo free. I know, girl. Glad that you could join us. Um, and for my Funnel Dynasty students, just tell them I put a post in the Facebook group. This is a really important training, and I will go a little bit more fine grain here. Um, and so we'll do the Funnel Dynasty training here today to kind of make up to everybody else, like that, all the people on my email list that I put this out to. I did say that this was a very important training today, and I wasn't just talking through my hat. It's important. And so I know my Funnel Dynasty students will benefit from this, and I know that anybody who's not in Funnel Dynasty today will benefit from it. Okay, so I did put a post in there, but if anybody can kind of like keep an eye on that group, if people are like, where are we today? Just send them over this way <laughs> and I'll, I'll handle everybody here because this is too important for me to go, hey, 15 minutes and then bye, everybody. All right. So we also talked about in the days leading up to here how no matter what you do, how big you are, or you aren't, you're going to face a lot of rejection, just statistically speaking. It's nothing personal. It's the institution. 98% um, of people who go to your website the first time won't buy, but you have to continuously drive traffic to your business to do more business. So you have to keep doing it. In time, you'll drive enough waves of people and those waves will get bigger and bigger as your platform gets bigger and bigger so that you can have more and more sales, right? That's important. Or at least capture leads onto your email list because you're probably three times more likely or, you know, to or 75% of your income from month to month really does tend to come from your email list. And about 25% is out in the wild through people who find your YouTube through a blog post or they find out about you on social and then they just go on their own to your website. But if somebody doesn't want to raise their hand to get onto your email list, the odds aren't that great that they want to buy from you. It's free for them to get on your email list. So why should they say no? You probably should have a very enticing email opt-in, a huge coupon if you're a product-based business, and some sort of freebie. Is it a guide? Is it a checklist? Is it a free video training series? Is it a masterclass slash webinar? If you're a coach, course creator, digital you know, content provider. Um, but at the end of the day, you get a lot of rejection because even when you have people on your email list... When you're first starting out and you don't have like a lot of KLT factor and no like and trust factor with them, you are very likely going to get only one in 10 people saying, yes, I will buy whatever, or I will take advantage of that sale, or I will click on that affiliate link and sign up for whatever. Um, as you get bigger and better, you might get two or three people out of 10 to say yes, but one out of 10 is normal. If all the kinks in your business are worked out. But, you know, there's a lot of rejection that you face because that just comes part and parcel with doing business 
and doing sales. Uh, there's a book that I recommend all my students read, which is Go for No. Um, who are the authors? This book's so important and it's a short read. I'm just going to pull it out really, really quickly. Where is it? Where is it? I always have it around. Did I lend this out to somebody and I forgot? No, here it is. Okay, so Go for No. I'm not going to drop any sort of link or anything to it. This is Go for No by Richard Fenton and Andrea Waltz, like the dance. That book really, it's a short read, um, but it teaches you a lot about the probability and statistics and what you have to go through to get a sale and to just understand that that's just part of the process. And so if you're happy to go for, say, nine rejections, because you know, statistically speaking, number 10 should be yes, then you will be happy to go for 100 no's to get 10 sales. Do you know what I mean? But if you're like, oh, no, after two, three rejections, I couldn't possibly continue to follow up with people, run sales, email my list, whatever, then you're not going to make much, if any, money. I don't care what your business model is, and I don't care if your product, services, coach, course creator. It doesn't matter. You have to get thicker skin. Um, so these are things that, and even yesterday, I talked about the fact that you, people need at least seven to 12 exposures to you before they even will pull the trigger, especially for a sale. Uh, you know, they may need that much like deposits into the bank of no like and trust, if you will, for them to even get onto your email list. Uh, because a lot of people know that they can subscribe and unsubscribe as they wish. But, you know, most people, if they're going to subscribe, they're going to want to stay on the list as opposed to be all flighty, right? So even though it's free for them to do so, they should know like and trust you enough to say, I know I'm going to get a lot of value. And yes, yeah, 60% of people who opt into an email list, they they understand and aren't don't mind at all to be sold to every single day. They just may not be able to buy every single day. But that's like 60%. So if you're really afraid to build an email list, because God forbid I email anybody that's going to be pushy, you're going to get unsubscribes whether you email a lot or a little. In fact, the, le the less you email your list, the more unsubscribes you're going to do because they're going to be like, who is this? I don't even remember them. Or I found somebody better who gives me a lot more value and is a lot more fun than somebody who's running their business like they're in the witness protection program. So we did talk about we did talk about how many uh, how many types of rejections that you can get and all of the different ways where, you know, you have to get your thicker skin together. Today, we are going to talk about hashtag optimization of your content. I'm going to start out a little bit broad in terms of how you should look at yourself and make hashtag you and hashtag your business more of a priority. And then we're going to talk about why hashtagging content the right way on platforms like Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter can help to blow up your self-esteem as well as your conversions. So this was too important of a teaching for me to jam it in in 15, 20 minutes because of all the tech stuff that's going on. So for my Funnel Dynasty students, I'm glad when you start watching this live or on the replay, uh, I'm very glad that you're here because you're going to be getting a lot of value out of this too. But of course, we'll go back to the Facebook group on Mondays at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time after this. So when you are running your business, as an entrepreneur, I think it was yesterday on the live, one of the live attendees, or maybe it was the day before, doesn't matter, was saying how she's kind of been, her business has been in the witness protection program because whenever she talks to some of the people closest to her, they kind of give her like a ton of side eye about it. Um, and or they're questioning the branding that she has because it doesn't seem to match her personality but she's done the industry market research. It's not about her. It's about the people she's serving. So she has the right branding for who she's trying to attract and approach. Um, but it's obviously not those people who are giving her side eye and questioning her. And no, it turns out they're not her ideal customers. They just happen to be people who might, you know, come across her business or she might raise the issue of her business in real life or she might post about it once in a blue on her social platforms, her personal social platforms, not just her business accounts, but her personal accounts. And it's like, you have to really not worry so much about 
friends and family or anyone else that runs across your personal and or business uh, accounts and content, uh, you can't worry about anybody's opinion from an entrepreneurial standpoint uh, unless they're your ideal customer or they're likely to be your ideal customer. Then you pay more attention to them. I mean, you can't please everybody all the time, but you know that as a card-carrying adult. But I want you to do what's necessary, especially if you missed the last couple of days, because um, they led into this. I want you to treat your business and your ideal customers and the offerings that you have for those people to help them get out of pain and into pleasure, to get the results, the meaningful results that are going to make a difference in their lives. I want you to treat all of that as noteworthy, meaningful, and important, and you're proud and instead of like worrying that you're too aggressive, be more assertive and definitely email that list. Post on social every day, at least the top two social media platforms that are most important to your ideal customer. If you're just starting out, you don't have a team, right? As you grow a team, like maybe you're intermediate, you're five figures and multiple five figures in terms of income. Um, you know, you're reinvesting some of your income back into a team. And so that team can help you get stuff out more. Maybe then it's three social media platforms. And by then you definitely have a YouTube channel for your business and on and on it goes. But if you're too concerned about what people, even if they're friends and relatives that are otherwise awesome to you, what they're going to say about your business or about, oh no, not another business from this one, because you might've tried a few before. And sometimes that's part of the journey. It's good to know what you don't want or what doesn't work for you. But now you're working whatever business model you're in. Now you have whatever business and offerings that you have for that specific ideal customer that you're trying to treat and trying to help. And you know what? You have to treat that business like it's sacrosanct or holy. Um, just like you wouldn't go hide your child because you're afraid your child is somehow less than or ugly. You should have a business that you feel is so important. It's beautiful. So many people, definitely the right people, your ideal customers need to see it, that it's capable of being elevated to hashtag worthiness, if you will. We are going to get into the specific of hashtags uh, and optimizing your content in a minute. We're just, we're going from broad into more narrow, okay? Okay. So you carry yourself and your business with you, at least conceptually, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, right? Um, and it's amazing how much, how proudly you'll hashtag things uh, that are totally like on your social account and it's content you're creating just for fun with your personal life. It has nothing to do with your business. That's cool. We all do some of that, right? You don't have any problems hashtagging your content because, you know, someone else should see it out there besides you just posting it to your personal account in this example. Like it's like a flyer you're posting on a bulletin board and, you know, there it is. You're going to hashtag stuff. And when you're hashtagging your personal stuff, your fun stuff, your jokes or whatever to be found by people, you know, you're elevating it so that it can be found and appreciated by others or else why else would you do it? Right. And you don't feel bad about doing that for your personal posts, whether they involve your family, your cute kids, your cute pets or whatever, you proudly are hashtagging stuff. You want your stuff to be found. You don't imagine that you're going to get cavalcades of hate and maybe one or two people who appreciate it, right? I mean, you don't have to tell me in the comments down below, but I want you to at least acknowledge to yourself that when you are dealing with yourself out there personally or the social media content that's meant to be personal and not business oriented, you probably optimize it and you're not expecting waves of hate. Hey, Tiffany, what's going on? So I bet you, I bet you you're not trying to hide those posts and, you know, that light under a bushel basket. So I want you to ask yourself a couple of questions uh, so that you can start to on your end of the equation, raise up just conceptually your business as something that's hashtag worthy in and of itself. We're going to get into the specifics of hashtag optimization for content in a minute. And I want you to ask yourself these questions 
kind of just to get your head screwed on straight about your business. Like number one, how often do you treat your business and its offerings as something that's an important topic of interest, period? Whether it would be posts that you do on your own personal account. The other day we talked about one post out of every 10 or so, plus or minus, can be about your business, your life as an entrepreneur. It's part of your life, right? But then, of course, you're posting on the daily on your business accounts, right? Like all your posts would be about that type of stuff. Uh, sometimes you can on your business account, like Maker Monday. A lot of my students know if they're having a hard time coming up with enough content to populate at least their top two social media platforms for their ideal customers every day, then they can have themes. And one of them's like Maker Monday, where people get to know the business owner a little more. And maybe those posts are a little bit more personal, but you're being vulnerable, you're being transparent, you're probably connecting whatever it is that you're sharing to your business, right, in some way, or show people how you're your own ideal customer or how whatever it is you're sharing shows that you understand your ideal customer themselves, even if you're not neatly one of them. But, you know, like you have no problem posting for yourself personally on behalf of your family, your pets, whatever you're proud about, your husband, wife, significant other doing, your kids doing. But how often do you treat your business as something that's just as post worthy and or hashtag worthy as the other stuff I just mentioned that are personal? How likely is it that you treat yourself as an entrepreneur, the you know, your business and the life that you spend, the lifespan that you spend working that business and your wants and your needs as a business owner um, in terms of what you want to get out of the business personally and professionally and even your wants and needs to help your ideal customer. Like how likely is it that you treat all that business related stuff as being just as important as like your human needs as a person or your needs in a healthy relationship? I mean, sometimes we treat our business like it's somehow other or it's not as important. It's not worthy of respect. Um, or when we post on behalf of our business, whether we're using hashtags or not, we, we have such a lack of self-esteem about it that no wonder we cut our noses off despite our faces, at least sometimes. No wonder suddenly anything else becomes busy, busy and more important and oops, we didn't post today. Or, you know, I keep saying I'm going to email my list and then I don't because, you know, oh, I'm scared to reach out to them. When you have a self-esteem issue as just a human being, that needs to be addressed. But maybe personally, you're pretty good. I have plenty of students who fit this category too. But when it comes to putting on their entrepreneurial hat, they're not comfortable, okay? And I understand, I'm not saying you're being silly, but what are you going to do to address that? And you have to ask yourself why you love your kids and your husband, wife, significant other, and maybe many other things that go on in your personal life. And you're proud to post about that. But suddenly you feel dirty and, and scared to post or email on behalf of your business. Why is it that you're sweeping yourself, your personal and your professional why, under the rug, right? On day one of this series, so again, the link down below will help you catch up because everything's in a playlist. On day one, we talked about the concept of having parallel, but equally important personally and professional wise that will drive us like and guide us like a North Star over the course of 2022. So we don't get to December 31st, 2022 and say, you know what, nothing happened with my business or nothing much happened with my business. Days two, three, five, and onward, at times we talked about professional entrepreneurial based goals and even having like a quick, just a couple minutes a day goal keeping kind of ceremony or observation so that we stay on track with our business goals. You can use this for personal stuff too. I'm just a business coach. So that's the lens that I shoot everything through. But so, how do you turn things around? so that you elevate your own rights, needs, and desires as an entrepreneur above the white noise that you would normally transfer your attention to, which means, you know, any friend, relative, neighbor, whomever, who isn't your ideal customer anyway, or they're just such toxic suspools, it doesn't matter, um, but you let all that white noise drown out 
your rights, your needs, your desires on behalf of your business, the offerings you create and you care about, and all the ideal customers that you want to help by virtue of your offerings to get out of pain and into pleasure. So it's really important that you catch up with the other days in this playlist because day one, we talked about focusing on your personal and professional why and how that's going to help and guide you. We talked about um, how to pursue your passions no matter what. So how to get forward motion so that you get unstuck. And I think that was day four. We were talking about what to do to keep moving forward if we find that we are in self-sabotage mode. We also spoke previously, we're going to get into optimizing content with hashtags in a minute, four different steps to optimize our sense of self-belief as an entrepreneur so that you can shut down your inner crit critic. You can remix any weaknesses that you keep beating yourself up with, especially entrepreneurially, into strengths. So that, that does help to boost your sense of self-belief. We spoke about how to take our professional, like, you know, um, the folks that we admire professionally um, and how to, um, how to reverse engineer what you respect about them. Uh, so that it either matches where you're at already and you should give yourself credit and or, you know, provide a guideline and a roadmap for you to evolve into um, another entrepreneur that is worthy of other people admiring. We talked about your S-M-A-A-R-T professional goals um, and how those help to create plans for you to actually achieve your business related goals. It is simply not good enough to set goals and then just, you know, pat yourself on the back for doing even that or announcing it publicly because then your subconscious mind feels like you already accomplished those goals and then you walk away from them. If you find yourself not optimizing your own self belief as an entrepreneur, if you find that you keep backing away from the edge of posting content, any second now we're going to get into optimizing that content with hashtags and um, how we're, we're possibly making mistakes doing that, um, you know, um, but I want you to find that every time you're professionally engaging in self-sabotage or in any way having negative beliefs um, about yourself, about your business, about your offerings, about your, I'm sure, very lofty goals for your business. I want you to trot out your why, personal and professional, that we set on day one. I want you to reflect on that. And every time you gravitate towards negativity, because we all do it to some extent, I want you to redirect yourself back to your why and back to the S-M-A-A-R-T goals that are plans and not just goals and then I want you to see where you're falling out of integrity with yourself um, with respect to one or more of those goals. And I want you to readjust and follow through. OK, and so, you know, because if you are not willing to really post on behalf of your business, if you're really not feeling comfortable or happy doing that, um, you don't believe your business is hashtag worthy. You don't believe your offerings unto themselves are hashtag worthy, but you'll believe that your social posts that have nothing to do with your business are, and they may be, and you'll hashtag them and optimize them to be found by bajillions of strangers if you could, because you're not expecting cavalcades of hate. But suddenly when you're an entrepreneur, you get paranoid, schizophrenic. I want you to engage in the self-reflection that's necessary Catch up on any lessons in this um, series. And again, the playlist will be pinned as a first comment below live and on the re replay. And maybe even if you're going to the library to get the book, Go for No by Richard Fenton and Andrea Waltz. I mean, even if you're not a reader, you could knock this out in like a day or a weekend. <laughs> the print's pretty big. Um, but it's just, it's the number one book, believe it or not, that I would start off any of my paid students on. Um, you know, and students in some of my other groups through the years are like, what are the top 10 books that you would recommend? That's one of them. Because once you understand the probability and statistics of things and how you have to get through a certain amount of exposure and have to get through a certain amount of rejection to be able to get the sales you need for your business to succeed, 
when you flip your concern about negativity on its head, you will not only post more on behalf of your business, you will follow through on optimizing those posts to be found as well. I'm going to take a very quick sip and then we're going to get right into optimizing things with hashtags. Okay. Um, and really quickly, <laughs> Heather says, good morning, hashtag live. Am I catching the end of the first meeting or the beginning of the second? It's actually both, Heather. That's a really good question because she's coming out of Funnel Dynasty to come here. Um, unfortunately, I had so many technical difficulties today. Hey, 23 days out of 31, I went without a problem. Day 24, I finally had an issue <laughs> and I had to reboot several, several times. Uh, posted in the group, we're at my YouTube channel now at uh, Bridget. See, I knew it. I knew I'd have to go into the Funnel Dynasty Facebook group. I did put a post there, but let me just go in here really quick. Uh, yeah. All right. So, all right. Really quickly, guys, uh, uh, you know, let me just grab a quick sip. It's been a rough morning. Hey, Christine. Yep. She says, good morning. Sounds great without the echo. Oh my God, Christine. I can't even tell you how many times I had to reboot. Um, like I said to everybody else, if you're going live on any platform and it's not just merely a connectivity issue, like, cause there's only so much you're going to be able to do about that. Go someplace, go to another location where you have better connectivity at the time. But that wasn't necessarily my problem. And it wasn't the mic. I played with my external mic. And that might be the first thing that you do if you have an external mic to play with. If you're using something on board, it's probably not this. Um, whatever device you're on, you might need to make sure the browser is updated and then refresh it. And even if the browser is updated, you still may have to refresh your own browser. Once you're done refreshing and or updating your browser, you then would have to update your operating system and reboot. Um, and sometimes just you're cold rebooting the device. And then if you have an external mic, you turn it back on. Although it was frustrating for me to go through four different attempts before this fifth one worked today, you cannot like give up and just run off. It sucks to be late for people. I have an email list of, I don't want to tell you how many people that I sent this to. And, you know, you look like a goofball if today just happened to be the first day someone was going to show up on your lives and go, what a mess. But, you know, what can you do, right? You can't lose your temper. Um, you have to be an adult and do your adulting. And that's what I had to do today. So I apologize for being late. And I apologize for not being live in the Funnel Dynasty group today. Um, Christine says, you are a rock star 24 days in a row for an hour each time. Get it, girl. Thank you. <laughs> But I'm just, uh, here she is. No, just on YouTube. Yep. So, and great leadership, Bridget. Come on, Miss Bridget. Come and join us because I know that you're there. Okay. So, let me get a quick soup, sip and then we're going to talk about optimization of content with hashtags. Please note down below also an additional comment that I put during the live. And on the replay, I'll put it in the show notes um, right at the top. There's a video that I did about a year and a half ago that talked about, and I, yeah, I did put it in there. Um, it's a great primer on optimizing with hashtags, and it talks about how to really shoot things through the lens of your intersecting interest, the interest that's going to connect your ideal customer to a business like yours with offerings like yours. So if anything I say during today's live, you're still like tap, 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 mm, I'm close, but I'm not quite sure I'm getting it. That's a great video to go look at. That had hundreds and hundreds of views on it um, and really good reception. So because optimizing things from a personal standpoint, your personal posts have nothing to do with your business and optimizing things from a professional standpoint, a lot of the advice I would give you could help you optimize things better with both types of posts. But the intersecting interesting is really important. So I Felt that this was too important to kind of blow everyone off on YouTube. And yet I still think it's so important that I want my Funnel Dynasty students to see it. So, of course, I'm going to post the replay of this in the group so that this way anybody who missed it will go up. Oh, yay. Okay, so here's the thing. Quick sip. 
If you have any questions about hashtag optimizing content, especially on Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok, the advice is pretty the same across the board. I'll focus on Instagram, but if you're like, hey, I happen to be on Twitter or TikTok more, or both of those more, the advice I give you would still work over there too. Um, but I have a couple extra quick tips to give about Instagram-based content, like where to put the hashtags and stuff like that. Uh, for Twitter and TikTok, it's kind of obvious where you would put it. You really don't have a lot in the way of choices. But if on the replay, <laughs> you are like, hey, you guys talked about so much. It's okay. What's going on, girl? <laughs> Promise, Bridget. Much love to you. Sorry. I knew some people were going to miss it. I'm still refreshing that group, trying to make sure I bring all my chicks over. Um. But I just, I, okay, let's see. So when it comes to optimizing content from an entrepreneurial standpoint, there's so many different ways you could be making mistakes and not realize it. Um, with Instagram, my advice would be, because uh, Twitter and TikTok, you don't have any choices. You're putting it in the caption or putting it in the tweet and that's it, okay? <laughs> you can't go wrong with where you're putting those, right? Your hashtags. And you don't have room on Twitter or TikTok. And Twitter actually gives you more characters within a, a tweet to put your actual tweet, including your hashtags. It's a little bit more generous than what TikTok is currently doing. Who knows? They might increase the size of the caption that each TikTok video will allow. But right now, it's less than 280 characters, right? You want to keep it to around 100 characters, I think, on TikTok, right? And that would include your hashtags. It's very, very tight. With Instagram, certain things that used to be best practice or at least okay to do, um, the CEO came out months ago and said, you know what, um, for Instagram Reels, you, it's best if you put all your hashtags in the caption. Um, you know, But for an Instagram Reel caption, it's the same size in terms of characters uh, as it is for regular feed post, uh, that caption or for Instagram TV, formerly known as IGTV, the caption that goes with that. Um, and that's 2,200 characters. So that's a lot. And I'm not saying that on Instagram, all your posts need necessarily be very long. Um, you could definitely mix up length and keep things fresh. Um, different readers, different content consumers appreciate different lengths. So don't just write just because you have all that space. But I'm letting you know that you have all that space because number one, you may not have known that on Instagram. And number two, like, if I'm telling you for your feed post, you may as well put all your hashtags in your caption. For your Instagram reels, you really need to put them all in the caption. Uh, Instagram TV, you really always had to put them in there. Um, you know, just treat them all the same. Um, and you're like, oh, but, like, I wanted to put a whole bunch of hashtags because I know you can get up to 30 hashtags on those things. You don't always have to go to all 30. I like you to try to optimize your content as much as possible. Um, if they didn't want you to use all 30 hashtags, they would just restrict you. So it's not like it's bad to do that. Don't believe any of those rumors. Uh, do what you can with what you're allowed to do uh, to optimize your content. Because use your head, the more hashtags your feed posts or Instagram reels or Instagram TV videos have in this example or even the more hashtags you can kind of cram into your tweet or your TikTok caption, the more ways you can be pulled up in search. So if you really weren't thinking about optimizing your posts so much that way, you should do it regardless of the platform. Fit in as many hashtags as you can. Hey, what's going on, Miss Amy Lindblade? Good to see you. Um, so here's the thing. That's number one. I know that most adults, even a lot of older ones now, they realize that on platforms like Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, using hashtags is important to be pulled up in search. If you've always thought of Google as a search engine, which it is, but you hadn't really thought of social media platforms as search engines, whether hashtags are usable on them or not, or important on them or not, surprise, social media platforms are search engines. Okay. So Twitter was the first to index content with hashtags. Um, then Instagram followed suit. 
And then you had TikTok, which, you know, especially after they took over Musical.ly, got more and more search engine-esque intense. Um, so you want to always view the content that you're posting on any platform as being content that's capable of being pulled up in search. I had a student who optimized just an event that had nothing to do with her business. It was like a car cruise. Um, and it was on Facebook. So hashtags really are kind of useless on Facebook um, right now. Who knows? Down the road, they could say, now, if you don't optimize with hashtags, it won't really work well on Facebook. But while we're shooting this live, that's not the point, the point or the issue. But she wrote a lengthier caption to go with her Facebook post. Um, and it had a lot of keywords in it, including geolocation-based keywords. And she said the amount of reach that that post got. And she was like, after having been a student of yours for a couple years now, it's hard for me not to optimize even for fun kind of car cruise posts. And the amount of people who showed up saying, I found you on Facebook. She's like, it really works. So what works with keywords on Facebook and elsewhere works with hashtags, especially on the top three platforms where hashtags are so important. And again, that's Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. So if you were posting content on those platforms and not using hashtags, and just because they say Instagram SEO is so important now, which it's been increasingly since the last year really now, um, that doesn't mean that hashtags aren't important on, uh, on Instagram. They are. It's just that the algorithms are evolving more on Instagram to the point where hashtags alone aren't the only important data points. Because of course, the more users you have, the more content that goes up, the more people who get savvy about optimizing content with hashtags, the more you're going to get the hashtags becoming more and more competitive, right? And we're gonna talk about competitiveness uh, when it comes to hashtags in a minute, because that's a mistake you might be making too. Um, so maybe you're like, well, Stacey, I'm using hashtags and, uh, you know, maybe I didn't know I could use up to 30 if I wanted for Instagram reels, Instagram TV and my garden variety feed posts. So I guess it makes sense to me that the more hashtags I use and in my captions that go with these, the more keywords that I use now, um, the more the algorithms that crawl all the content and surface all the content it's going to pull up more data points. Yes, I'm going to make it easier for my content to be found in search, but I'm also giving the algorithms data points, more and more data points to be able to make decisions about who to suggest this content out to as well. Um, because I'm going to be honest with you, you can and should do very well in terms of optimizing your content for search, especially using hashtags because that's a feature for today. But where you're going to get true supersonic growth is when your stuff gets suggested out to other users of the platform as well. But that's not going to happen at all or much, or it's not going to happen very efficiently if you're not really thinking and being very strategic about the keywords that you use in your captions and about, again, the focus today is hashtags, about the hashtags that you're using on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, let's say. So here's the thing. You might not also have thought about the hashtags that you're using. Um, I mean, a lot of people will know this now, but some people, I just don't want to skip this over. You don't want to use hashtags that are too broad to optimize your content. Um, and that's like a common rookie mistake that people can make. So if you're using something like hashtag hamburger, if you're Joe's Dairy Bar and Grill creating content, I mean, it's such an over-competitive hashtag that it's going to be very difficult to be seen. Okay. It's going to be very difficult to be seen because sure, you're going to be indexed for hashtag hamburger on, say, Instagram, but you'll also be buried in seconds by everyone else that's using hashtag hamburger, whether it's businesses that are showing product shots with hamburgers or in, in them, or it's anybody else out there who's like, oh, I really love this hamburger. Let me take a picture of it. Hashtag hamburger. Like you're going to get buried in seconds. So maybe you've been making the mistake of sure, I've been using hashtags, 
I might have even been using a lot of hashtags, right? But I've been relying on overly broad hashtags, and I didn't realize that I'm going to get buried in seconds, right? So, oops, you need to look at just how competitive the hashtags are when you are creating content to be found in search um, for your business and your business accounts, because what's the point of doing all the work to create the content? You're optimizing with hashtags and it's going to get buried in seconds. No one's going to see it, right? Like, sure, you can follow hashtags on Instagram. Sure, you can. And you can pull up a hashtags feed on Instagram. Sure, sure you can. You know, let's do a hashtag hamburger right now. You could do this with me if you want. Hashtag hamburger currently has over 6.2 million posts. So, I mean, you know, this is in dark mode, but it just, you know, really, people might be bored and they might scroll for like a while because they can go by top, they can go by recent, they can also look specifically for reels now, okay? But if we go through recent, you could be going on and on and on forever, <laughs> You know, pulling up every last post that got optimized with hashtag hamburger. No one's going to do that for more than a few minutes, no matter how bored they are. So you need to start thinking about how can I be competitive in terms of my hashtags? Even just doing that in a generic conceptual way will help your content be seen by more people. Now, if you're Joe's Dairy Bar and Grill, you want to use all 30 hashtags or at least use a couple dozen hashtags. You could maybe use hashtag hamburger if it has anything to do with the content, but you just push it towards the end and it's kind of like a Hail Mary pass, but you don't really expect you're going to get massive results by using an overbroad hashtag. Like, cause that just generally doesn't happen or like lightning struck, but that's not the way I'd want to handle my content marketing, right? You're a busy professional with a busy personal life too. It, you know, you don't have time to just create fluff content that goes nowhere and doesn't lead you to any of the three macro conversions that you need. And the most important one is that last one, which is sales, right? It's great to build up an email list. Sure. Uh, you're more likely to get sales from email list members and folks otherwise out in the wild. So it is important to do lead capture. You will get that third macro conversion more because the second one is that grows. You grow that. And of course, having a bigger social following is great for social proof. Um, and the more involved your social um, following is with you and each other in the comments and stuff, comment threads on posts, your YouTube videos, whatever, that's great too. But, um, you know, you can't deposit followers or subscribers in the bank. You can't deposit email list subscribers into the bank either, but you're more likely to get sales from them. So again, that's why it's so important. But if your content isn't driving more traffic to your business to do more business, then you just wasted your time. Um, you know, when people talk about content marketing taking forever to bring you results, that's not entirely true. It's very rarely lightning strikes and tomorrow, boom, you start making money like crazy. Have I had students from year to year that they're smart, they're good at optimization, and in 30 days, they can go from zero to hero. Sure, I've had product-based businesses do it. Um, I've had, I had an influencer who wanted to be a hockey influencer. And he wanted to grow um, himself on YouTube and even get a podcast up and running. Um, you know, Dennis Moorhead. And in 30 days, he went from absolute zero, creating all his accounts for social media, and he started getting scouted by other big folks with connections to the NHL and more specifically uh, Rangers, the Rangers. Um, so you can do it um, and you can get a lot of nice results inside of 30 days. Um, but you're not going to get anywhere if your stuff's drowned out. And sometimes it takes a couple more weeks to get things really up and running. But if you're getting sales, and or if you're Dennis, you're getting people approaching you saying, just pick up these um, analytics a little more and we can get you sponsorships. We can get you uh, bigger connections. You know, it doesn't have to take forever in a day, but you have to be able to optimize your content to be found by the right ideal customer or folks that are connected to your ideal customer. So when we're thinking about 
hashtags that you can be competitive for. A rough estimate that I'll give you for purposes of this live stream. Um, and Funnel Dynasty people, we can talk about this more in the posts in the group. Um, I would not try to use hashtags that are, you know, like if you're not using a tool like Flick, Flick is um, the hat, the paid hashtag tool that I recommend to people. And you can go down in the show notes live or on the replay and you can see the link that'll give you a week free of Flick with like everything unlocked to it. They have different plans and packages. It's what I swear by. Um... But if you don't have that tool, there are free tools out there that I just think are a big waste of time. You're almost just better off if we're talking about free going on, say, Instagram and playing around with hashtags to see how much use it is. If a hashtag isn't doesn't have very much use, like it's way under a thousand, you know, pieces of content that's been optimized with a given hashtag. I'm not saying you never use it. If you're like, man, I think this hashtag would be important to me. And I, I know that this product or this trend or this whatever should be trending up because I've been studying the market and not just my ideal customer. I study them both. And I'm really surprised that this hashtag has only 100 uses or less. You know what? Your finger might be on the pulse. You might want to take note of that hashtag and keep visiting it every couple of days to a week. Because if you're right, it'll quickly get to a thousand uses or higher. But if I were optimizing a piece of content with hashtag hamburger, anything a million and over is just land of the loss for sure. Like that's an easy bright line. So I would not try to use hashtags like that ever. Why bother? Or, you know, all right, I'm getting close to 30. I feel like hitting all 30 hashtags. Why not? Hail Mary pass. Hashtag hamburger. 6.2 million posts. Um. Hamburger Haven is 260,000 posts. I think that anything that is a couple thousand to 10,000 to tens of thousands in terms of use currently as a hashtag, go for it and have a mix or a blend of those. Because obviously, once you're over a thousand, to me, there's just enough use of it to make it like interesting and competitive without it being so small that it's just a trickle. Right. Again, when you're an entrepreneur, you want your posts to get you like snappy macro conversions, more followers, more email list subscribers, and of course, more sales. You go in too low and too slow when something's like 100 or less uses. And that's all or most of the type of hashtags that you use. <clears throat> but you can study them and see if the usage goes up or you can use a tool like Flick.Tech to help you see, is it really trending up? Is there a lot of engagement? with posts that are like a thousand, a couple hundred, only a hundred posts, you know, is it increasing in terms of post favor? Uh, maybe that will confirm your suspicions about your ideal customer research and target market research for now. So like when I'm telling you to really, really pay attention to your optimization, if you don't, or you're too slipshod about it, or just whatever, I got to get this post out today, you could be screaming into a vacuum, creating a bunch of content that no one's going to see or almost no one's going to see, or God help you, the wrong person's going to see. Um, you know, because if it's not your ideal customer who's more likely than not going to see this stuff, then who cares, you know? Because um, if a million people see you, but nobody buys from you, then that's just as frustrating. Um, there was actually, oh, I don't want to grab the link now. I had to relaunch my browser so many times to get this live stream working today which is not usually what happens. Um, but there is um, an article out there. I'll try and see if I can find it later. Um, it was about an influencer that had like millions of followers, but couldn't even sell 32 t-shirts. Like what's the point of having this ginormous social media following that you can't leverage from an entrepreneurial standpoint to get sales? So this is going to take me into buyer intent hashtags. So... <clears throat> Especially on Instagram where you can use more hashtags, do I recommend going into the hundreds of thousands with your hashtag? Sure, use some of those, but just know that the bigger it gets, the less competitive you're going to be, you know, or you'll be competitive, but for the less, least amount of time. So thousand, couple thousands, you have a really good chance at being found. Tens of thousands, still good, but obviously we're getting a little cooler now. <laughs> 
hundreds of thousands, same thing. But, you know, once you're like past five, 600,000, once you're a million or more, like those are just Hail Mary passes. On Instagram, where you might have a couple of extra hashtags to, you know, quote unquote, waste or gamble on, I'm not saying don't use them, but I would prioritize the first five, 10 hashtags that I would use. Or if I was only going to use five, 10 hashtags to optimize a piece of content with, say on Instagram, I would make all those count. Okay. So not too big, not too small. You kind of think of Goldilocks and the three bears, not too hot, not too cold. Okay. So, but now let's talk about buyer's intent because everything I just said, you could use to optimize personal content like crazy and it would work too. Um, you know, just the same as it would work for your business account. But when we start talking about hashtags that have buyer's intent, that's critical, okay? Because that's where you're more likely to get sales from the 25% of people that are browsing that might buy from you, where roughly three quarters of people who are likely to buy from you or more likely to buy from you will come from your email list. But you have to kind of, especially when you are posting product or service or offering based content for sure, you have to think about buyer's intent when you're publishing. Let me give you an example of a mistake that one of my past students made. And this was a huge aha moment for her because she's like, Stacy, I'm definitely hashtagging or maybe I wasn't before. Uh, I'm making sure that I have more than one or two or three hashtags, especially on Instagram, might not be able to fit it elsewhere. Uh, I am making sure, I didn't say this before, but I'll say this really quickly. Don't use hashtags that have nothing to do with your content. Okay. Um, don't do that <laughs> because the algorithms on all the platforms are getting very, very careful. They're getting very, the machine learning is advancing. That's the proper verbiage for me to use. So they are picking up red flags a lot faster. Um, so make sure that the hashtags that you use kind of conform to at least what the content itself is and or if you've got keywords that are unpacking the content or adding extra layers of context to it, then you're probably fine because everything gets surfaced holistically and then it's like, okay, I don't have to flag this for spam because maybe the picture or the graphic wasn't very obviously connected to some or all of the hashtags that were being used. But wait, there's a caption where the content creator goes back and unpacks and layers context over the photo. So now I get it. It makes sense. And if they're using natural language or not keyword stuffing in the caption. So, all right, these, these hashtags, I get, they pass. Don't ever use hashtags that have no connection to the caption and or content itself, whether the content's a picture, a GIF, a a meme, uh, you know, video, a reel, whatever. Be very, very careful because these things are much smarter than a fifth or seventh grader now. They will pick things up that one or two years ago they didn't even pick up. So I probably didn't have to say that to a lot of you, but some of you might be like, oh, maybe I can get away with this. No, don't bother. Especially if you're looking for stuff for optimization, I should say, that leads you to buyer intent. So I had this student of mine who had a pair of earrings that she wanted to sell. And they were hummingbird earrings. Gorgeous. And she's like, I don't know. The photo is really good. Uh, I was very careful about filters and lighting. And I'm like, the content itself is gorgeous. And it very clearly shows these are hummingbird earrings. And, you know, the caption was neat. Um, it was descriptive. But the hashtags that she used, and let just, let's just be clear, this was a feed post on Instagram, the hashtags that she used was like hashtag hummingbird, which is way too competitive. Um, hashtag hummingbirds of Instagram. Hashtag hummingbirds. Um, you know, things like that. There really wasn't much in the way of hashtag hummingbird jewelry. And what I said to her, keeping things simple for this example, is your, your, not going to get folks very likely with buyer's intent when they are, let's just pretend she could be competitive for hashtag hummingbird or hashtag hummingbirds for a quick second. You are not likely going to get somebody with buyer's intent 
if you're searching up on Instagram under keyword or hashtag both for hummingbird or hummingbirds, are you necessarily looking for jewelry? Tell me the truth in the comments down below. Maybe it's just me. Yes or no, simple. I just want to see as I take this next sip, how many people are going to say yes and how many people are going to say no. If you're searching on hummingbird or hummingbirds on Instagram, are you looking for hummingbird jewelry? Just let's be honest. Because here's the thing. My guess would be no. I'm thinking of looking at the birds. I'm an, I'm an animal lover. Bridget from Bridget Upcycle Lawson says probably not. Yeah, probably not. Now, just like I said by like, okay, if you want to use some hashtags that are Hail Mary passes at the end of your like hashtag constellation or cloud uh, on Instagram, but you understand that those are Hail Mary passes and they're likely not going to do anything for you. Fine. When you're using keywords that don't have buyer's intent attached to them, you're not, you're not likely going to get somebody who's interested in buying, in this example, jewelry at all. But, you know, could you argue that if somebody's an animal lover and if somebody's a hummingbird lover, that if this comes up in their feed for hashtag hummingbird or hashtag hummingbirds or hashtag hummingbirds of Instagram, they just love animals and they love hummingbirds so much that you might get one in a million that goes, oh, I'm feeling jewelry today. I'll buy that. You know, I'm not saying Hail Mary passes can't ever work. But the problem is, do you have the time and the patience as an entrepreneur to create the content or pay other people to do some or all of this for you. And then you put it out and people are like, whatever, you know, no, that's not going to get you more followers. It's not likely to anyway. It's not likely to get people on your email list to get a coupon. If you're a product space business for your first purchase with them. And it's not likely going to get you a sale either. I don't mean to be a downer, but this is all the difference between posting something for folks that are pulling this up in search who have a buyer's intent to buy jewelry. More specifically in this example, hummingbird jewelry. If you're finding any value, both live and on the replay, could you give this video a big thumbs up? Because while I'm live, the more engagement and interaction the algorithms on YouTube see, the more likely it is going to push this out to folks that have subscribed to me while I'm live. And then on the replay, even so, it's more likely to push this replay into the feeds of my subscribers on YouTube. Um, but also, let's look at hashtags in terms of data points for the algorithms to surface so that they can make more intelligent decisions in terms of suggested, because search is important and people who have buyer's intent it's important that they can find what they're looking for in search, okay? As opposed to doing a Hail Mary and maybe someone who loves hummingbirds will see your hummingbird jewelry and go, ooh. So am I saying don't use hashtag hummingbirds of Instagram in this example? I'm not saying don't use it, but it wouldn't be the foot I lead in the dance with with my optimization. And if I'm on another platform where I don't have up to 30 to go to in terms of hashtags I could use, um, like Twitter or TikTok, I would not waste my hashtags at all on something that in this instance, because it's showcasing a product, the content, I, I would never do anything other than for folks who have buyer's intent or might likely have buyer's intent, right? Hey, Michael Cole, what's going on, right? Everybody said no. All right, I don't feel bad. What's going on, Michael Cole? What's up? Okay. So how many of you, you don't necessarily have to answer me this, but live or on the replay, how many of you were really thinking more specifically of picking keywords or hashtags that would get you pulled up in search on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, that has to do with buyer's intent? Because you're a business, not every post is going to be a straight up sales-based post 
or a product or services or offerings based post. But for those that are or could be, don't you think it's important to optimize, uh, you know, with buyer's intent in mind because you want to sell, right? So every view is not created equal. All views are not created equal. Well, I like you getting views on stuff because it makes your heart go pitter patter. Um, and while I like you getting likes and comments, because sure, that makes your heart go pitter patter. It's not like this is some hobby of yours. You have to get people who are willing to at least get on your email list and buy from you when they can. Uh, if that's not happening or it's not happening often enough, you have a very time consuming hobby and nobody needs that. So I don't know if you were thinking in terms of buyer's intent, but you should. On Twitter and TikTok, I would almost always try to make sure that you've got buyer's intent hashtags. On, on Instagram, you might have some more room for Hail Mary passes. But Oh, and by the way, let me not forget, on Instagram stories, you're only allowed 10 hashtags anyway. So like, again, if you're going to have an Instagram story that is sales-based straight up, or you could be creating content that um, is entertainment-based, inspiration-based, um, and or education-based, and you're just showcasing your products, I would still try to get some of the hashtags in uh, my Instagram story-based content uh, to deal with um, buyer's intent, as opposed to just straight up explaining what's in there um, or indexing that piece of content for search um, or suggested um, you know, just based upon descriptive hashtags. Yes, the hashtags you use have to have some sort of causal connection or nexus to the content itself, like I said earlier. But as an entrepreneur, I would I would prioritize hashtags that are uh, for those that have buyer intent. Um, because there's the buyer aware, there's the pain aware, and then there's solutions aware. They're kind of up the middle. So you can create hashtags that have to do with solutions as well. And those can get people into the buyer aware state and it can still get your sales a whole lot faster. At least people getting on the email list and as soon as possible, giving you a sale. Um, so solutions aware kind of hashtag optimization. You have to understand your ideal customer enough to know what their pain points are and how they're either creating content that has to do with keywords or hashtag beast, um, the, um, the pain that they're experiencing, because some people will just happily share their pain, um, and even the solutions that they're looking at. You have to understand what your competitors are putting out that might be similar or similarly situated solutions to yours. And so the more solutions aware is going to start researching all their options all the different solutions to handle the different symptoms of the pain point that they have. So again, like using hashtags in this example that are descriptive and have a causal connection or nexus to the content is great, but what's even better are using hashtags for people that are actually searching up the symptoms, actually searching up the problems, actually look, looking up content to binge on that is, um, having to do with solutions uh, because the pain aware may also pull vault into becoming buyer aware if your content is really cool. Um, not really cool. Well, yeah, really cool, but you're really good for conversions in and of itself. But the pain aware may not be ready to pull the trigger yet. They're researching solutions or options, right? Whatever terminology fits your business model best and your offerings best. Um, but buyer aware, they're generally ready to pull the trigger, right? So if I'm looking for hashtag hummingbird jewelry or hashtag hummingbird earrings, I'm searching up for stuff to buy, right? Um, so hashtag hummingbird earrings is very buyer aware. Hashtag hummingbird jewelry could be buyer aware, could be solutions aware. I like hummingbirds. I want jewelry. I may not be fixated on earrings yet for them, but you know, um, you know, and then I guess pain aware in that example <laughs> might be people who just love hummingbirds. And so you could do some Hail Mary passes, but 
people who are like pain aware or passion aware, you might be a passionate hummingbird lover or passionate animal lover. Sure, they might be like binging all sorts of content to have fun with, but that doesn't mean they're ready to buy hummingbird jewelry, let alone they're specifically looking for hummingbird earrings because they know they want them for themselves or someone looking to buy a gift. Does any of this make sense to you guys? Because this is important. This is important. I do not want you guys to be creating content just to stick it up on a bulletin board and it's like a Hail Mary pass. Oh, thank you, Christine. I'm looking in the Funnel Dynasty group. What leadership? You and Anne, really great. Christine created a, po a comment with a red thumbtack thumb that says, please note new live video started as original one in technical difficulties. Stacy is now live here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Oh, and you did it again in another post too. And another. Oh, love the leadership. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Okay, so at least my uh, Funnel Dynasty peeps, we've covered our base. Do you guys have any questions of me when it comes to hashtag optimization on any platform? Because um, I'm happy to do some Q&A at least through 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and then for my Funnel Dynasty peeps, if you want to put separate posts having to do with optimization, especially hashtag based optimization. Um, definitely put that in the group. You guys know I have my office hours. I flit in and out of all my groups. My goal is never to leave you hanging. And the four steps to optimize your self-belief as an entrepreneur, that was day seven, if you missed that. Okay. S-M-A-A-R-T goals for your business, including income-based ones and how to reverse engineer so that you're not just looking at what I want to make in 2022 because I want to do X, Y, and Z. It's like literally breaking it down by the month, by the week, and even by the day, how much income you have to pull in to meet your goals. That was really important. Those were days two, three, and I believe five. Um, we talked about a power hour for your business, and that was day 19. I cannot believe we're finishing up day 24 here. That's scary. We're already 24 days into this year. Um, the goal-setting ritual or the goal-keeping ritual that I talked about earlier, that's day five for sure. Um, and then having the overall plan for your business and how to long-term plan it, short-term plan it, and how to make adjustments, um, and how to have systems in place to tend the garden of your business. That was day 16 while I'm waiting for questions or comments to roll in. And I see none. Have I just been so super thorough? <laughs> That you guys are like, whoa. Um, let me see. I'll also introduce what we're going to talk about tomorrow. Funnel Dynasty students, you guys let me know when you're ready for me to, in our weekly lives in the paid student only group, let me know when you're ready for me to spotlight your business. But I wouldn't recommend us doing that. I mean, I'll do it, but I wouldn't recommend us doing that until you at least get through those seven modules of the course. Uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about branding, how to sell yourself as an entrepreneur and your professional based goals. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. We're going to tap on several elements of branding that people often leave out because a lot of y'all get all excited about the logo and the colors and the fonts, like the hex color codes of the colors and stuff. And like those things can be important. Your market research and your ideal customer based more narrowed down research can help you to kind of like narrow down the field on what colors or fonts or, you know, imagery will either compel them to towards your brand and business more or might likely be too loud, too clashy or too much for them and repel you. Um, what I do find as an aside is that a lot of people stay too long at the fair when it comes to branding. Um, and, you know, you can always make tweaks and alterations as you go, but some people just get stuck in branding. 
But outside of those more obvious things, when you're thinking about branding, um, there's several branding elements that people often skip. So I want to make sure that you guys don't skip those things. Don't want you to stay too long at the branding fair, but you'll know you're done with branding, at least for now. You can always iterate and grow when you are looking at these extra elements. Uh, there's like at least three of them that we will talk about tomorrow during the live. That's the plan. That's the plan. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, let's see. And then there's another one. Oh, there's a little more. We'll talk about how to enjoy the business of being an entrepreneur also tomorrow. Um, but if you want more specific stuff to help you with your business, definitely you want to look at the video that I shared down below that I'll also put in the show notes. And that's blow up your business with this hashtag strategy. It talks a little bit more, gives you some other um, ideas and elements when it comes to uh, buyer aware or, um, you know, optimization through keywords and hashtags, quite frankly, but um, through hashtags that will pull someone who's ready to buy or not very far from being ready to buy towards you. Um, so you definitely don't want to miss that video. Anybody? Y'all are good? Really? I'm going to take an extra sip, but if you have any questions about anything we covered, now's the time. If you're watching on the replay, you're not left out. You can definitely ask your questions on the replay in the comments section below the video replay, and I'll get to you within like, say, 24 hours. Going once. Going twice. Making sure I'm not missing anybody else. Sold. I guess we're good today. All right. Uh, Funnel Dynasty people, if you have any specific questions after watching this live or on the replay and you want to post it in the group, I will check things out in the group and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.